Good morning and welcome to our online service. My name is Catherine Tate. I'm one of the ministers here at Skipton Baptist Church. We're so glad you can join us for our service this morning and hope you're looking forward to engaging in worship with us as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're looking forward to hearing Phil speak to us later on in the service. Before we start, there's just a few notices. A reminder that we now have our weekly church prayer gatherings at 8.45 before the morning service and at 5.45 before the evening service. Both of these gatherings are in the youth room and you're welcome to come along to those even if you can't make it to the service itself. And on Wednesday the 13th of July, we're going to have a church meeting, but it's going to be a church meeting with a difference. It will be starting a little bit earlier than normal at half seven with a normal church meeting. But please don't anyone can come to that, even if you're not a church member. And then at 8.30, we want to encourage anyone who's interested in finding out a little bit more about our vision for the house. That's this group of buildings next door to church, which if you've been observant, you'll notice some building work going on. Um, and it's a chance just to come and hear our, the opportunities we're hoping to have there and some news about that. So please come along on the 13th of July if you can to find out more. And thinking about church meetings and membership. If you're at all interested in finding out what church membership involves, then please speak to Phil or to Joe Nixon, our church secretary. And one more date for your diary. On Sunday the 24th of July at our 10am service, we're going to be having a commissioning service for Phil as our lead minister. And this service will be followed by our annual picnic at the field up at Sturton. More details to follow. So before we move into time of worship together, let's pray. Come now into the presence of our holy and loving God. Come just as you are, with all your fears and uncertainties, your sadness and your joy. Come to the God who sees and knows all. Come to the Christ whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. Come to the Holy Spirit whose counsel is wise and gentle. Come this morning, just as you are, to worship. Amen. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed Messiah still and all 
morning we're going to follow the pattern provided by the Lord's Prayer and I'll leave a moment's pause after each section for you to pray silently for the people places and situations especially on your hearts. Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Father thank you that we can call you Abba Father that we can come before you as your beloved children. Thank you that although you created the whole universe you love and care for each of us more deeply than we can ever imagine. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come in our lives, our families, our workplaces, our streets, our towns and our villages and those parts of the world where there's violence, conflict or persecution. We pray especially this morning for all those in Ukraine. We pray for an end to the Russian invasion and ask that you'll be close to all those living in fear of attack and who had to flee their homes to seek safety. We also bring before you those in the persecuted church who risk their lives simply by believing in you. Give them the strength they need to hold on to you and their heavenly future with you in the face of earthly persecution and even death. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to seek your guidance and keep your commandments. We bring before you now those things and situations which we're struggling with at the moment. We also bring before you those we know who are sick or finding life difficult or who are grieving. Give us today our daily bread. We pray for those who live in hunger and poverty, both in this town and worldwide especially with the rising prices we're all facing at the moment. We thank you for the wonderful work of Skipton Food Bank, for Emma and Alison and all the volunteers who helped to run it. We also thank you for Ruth and Kat and her team of befrienders. Further afield, we thank you for the international aid agencies that help those in extreme hunger in other countries. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Because we have broken your commandments, doing what we ought not to do and neglecting what we ought to do. And help us by your grace to forgive those who've angered or injured us in any way, as you forgive each of us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us, Lord, to prioritise spending time with you and reading your word, so we can have the strength to resist temptation when it comes our way. Help us be honest with ourselves and be willing to reach out to others for help when needed, when we know we're faced with temptation. 
Thank you that your unending grace, mercy and love are freely available to us, no matter how many times we get things wrong. Hear our prayers, Lord, the spoken and the silent. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy
Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you.
stop, never stop working Even when I can see it, you're working Even when I can feel it, you're working You never stop, never stop Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing one more time. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. When I was a nine-year-old boy in primary school, um, I used to think that being a Christian was cool. Uh, I still do, um, but uh, this particular time, I was about nine, I was sitting in my class and we were watching one of those movies on a real projector, you know, ones that had to be replaced, and we were waiting for a reel to be replaced. And I sat there and I was sat next to a girl who I really liked. And me, under the impression that being a Christian was really cool, um, I wanted to impress her. And so I, during, while we were waiting, was looking out of the window to the middle distance and I closed my eyes and uh, just kept a little bit of a half eye open to see if she was watching me. And eventually she turned to me and said, so what are you, what are you doing? And I turned to her and I said, actually, I'm praying because I thought she would be impressed with that. She wasn't. And I don't think God was either, if I'm honest, although I suspect like an eye rolling parent, he probably was laughing at my sheer stupidity. But that picture came to mind as I was looking at what Jesus is addressing about our outward displays of our faith. Hopefully not as embarrassingly as that story I just told. Here in these verses in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is turning his attention to our spiritual interactions. And what's common so far is Jesus is digging below the obvious, the visible outward actions to try and get behind, to see, to see the attitudes behind these practices, these acts of righteousness, as he calls. And particularly, he's looking here at three pillars of piety in the Jewish faith, giving, prayer and fasting, as they're outlined in the Old Testament and in, in the law. And these were common religious practices. And I use that term intentionally. They were religious practices. But note from the outset, something really significant here. Jesus in all three areas does not water down the validity of these activities. Again, he's not removing the law. He's picturing what being a follower of him looks like. And his aim is getting at the heart and the attitude behind the actions. So Jesus says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast... Now, he says when, not if. 
Now, firstly, it's not a commandment as some were and maybe some still treat them as, but as accepted common practices. This is what you do in worship and devotional life. Again, it's not about the action, but the attitude, which is really common in the Sermon on the Mount. So giving, prayer and fasting, these are acts of righteousness. We may call them spiritual disciplines. They're not the only ones, but they are exemplars of spiritual practices. There are many others, reading God's word, worship, and many others. And we looked at a whole range of these. I was surprised to realize seven years ago in a series called The Beautiful Disciplines. And I was going to encourage you to go back and re-listen to them, but at the moment they're not available on our online library. So maybe it's time we, we look at them again in more detail. But spiritual disciplines are important. Take these three amongst the others. Giving. Now, giving reminds us that we, that first of all, all we have is firstly given by God, the great giver. And we need to replicate his giving as a response to his goodness and his character. And it's also with a sense of responsibility for us using what he's given to us to bless and look after others. And in that way, in that attitude of giving, we may be able to counter and be released from the bondage and the grip of of what so ties us up these days, especially acquisition and materialism. But we can move on from giving to prayer. Now, we've spent a lot of time and there's been much said about prayer. But what Jesus says here, I really like. He essentially says, don't faff around or fluff up or try and flatter God. Don't be like the pagans. You know, like when someone comes up, maybe one of my kids will come out and say, Dad, you know, you're really nice. You're really kind and generous. And the immediate response is, what do you want? Because that's probably what's going to happen next. And Jesus is getting at, he says, there's no need. The first thing in the model that Jesus gives us, what we know as the Lord's Prayer, he says, the first thing is our Father. This is about relationship, not a religious practice or some kind of divine exchange. And we can take this model prayer. In fact, we can take a lot of spiritual disciplines and turn them into repeated religious actions or almost like this a liturgical mantra. You don't believe me? Just think about whenever we recite the Lord's Prayer out loud. How many who arts, thys, trespasses and thines do we just trot out? Maybe we should think about trying different words, different translations to get a grip of actually Jesus is modelling what prayer is about. It's not just a repetition. It's about a relationship. And we move on to fasting. Now, fasting, a lot of people got different opinions about, different experiences. It's not about spiritual superiority. Scripture often shows the fasts are not about a sense of holiness, but are connected to confession, lament, sorrow, repentance, and more associated with returning sinners than rejoicing saints. It's not about health or weight or image or even testing our own self-discipline. Fasting has no power in and of itself. Instead, it creates space. It creates a vacuum to fill with God. We are to fast from what distracts us. And in days gone past, a lot of our preoccupation was about food procurement and about production, about supplying our needs. And then and what, that, what people did was that they would carve out time and space to fast from the food procurement in order to feast on God. And maybe today our distractions are different to food procurement. And that's the sort of thing we need to consider fasting from. How about fasting from our devices, those things that might take up our time from devoting to God. These disciplines and practices that we've looked that we're having here, they are important for our spiritual maturing and for knowing God. They are needed. We do need these disciplines, but what Jesus is doing here is more than outlining a how-to guide for giving, prayer and fasting. I love Jesus' rhetoric here and the older I've got as a Christian The more I've read and studied the Gospels, the more I see how Jesus uses language tools to grab attention, to provoke, engage and challenge his readers in ways that maybe I wasn't totally uh, aware of when I was younger. He uses exaggerated imagery and humour and hyperbole here and satire to hit home his point to all his listeners. And he paints vivid, almost comedic pictures of the hypocrites and the pagans parading themselves as epitomes of righteousness, as spiritual giants, just like I did as a nine-year-old boy in that classroom. But Jesus' target seems to be the religious elite, the pious performers. 
and he does this in typical brilliant rhetorical style, as we say. He doesn't even need to mention Pharisees, Sadducees, priests and scribes. The images he evokes are unmistakable. And he calls them hypocrites. Now, we might know already this is the same word that's used as, as actors in Greek theatre, mask wearers. And we might ask the question, mask wearers, hypocrites, us, as the religious leaders maybe did then. Hypocrisy is one of those charges so often laid at the door of church and of Christians. What we say and what we do maybe don't match up. And they're seen in extremes when Christians, especially Christian leaders, publicly fall from grace. But are we all hypocrites? Are we two-faced? I think two-faced actually underplays it. Because we have many faces, don't we? Many roles, and not all of those are wrong. We have roles and faces at work, at home, among social gatherings, at church. We all wear masks in some way or form, demonstrated in the, the interaction, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, even if you are falling apart. I hope we're less like that at church, I really do. But I don't believe for a moment that amongst every smiling person that comes through those doors this morning at church, that there aren't some, or indeed many, that haven't had a really tough morning, a rough week, or who are carrying worries or fears or doubts they just feel they can't share right now. And that's okay. That's understandable. We need to respect that at times. And sometimes we need to just keep going in order to function. But I hope and pray that we can all find positive outlets for these times and feelings. Because even the most seemingly pious, overt worship and worshipper and clearly spiritual person may not be giving the full picture, the whole story to us all the time. Because we can wear masks and we can pretend too, can't we? And we can do it for a number of reasons. Typically, maybe for pride, looking for that sense of affirmation, respect and position from others around us. To be esteemed and valued. If that's what you're looking for, you may get it. And that's what Jesus says. But that's all you'll get when there's so much more. Now, this obvious ego driven performance may not be the case for most of us. But the other motivator might be pressure. That kind of sense of Christian keeping up appearances to look like you're doing the right thing. Less for ego's sake and more to try and meet a sense of perceived expectations from those around us. This is how I should be acting. Now, I remember a few years ago. I'm sitting in the front row of church and I was feeling really rubbish at the time. And looking back now, I now know that I was experiencing some level of burnout, anxiety and a bite of depression. But at the time, I distinctly recall feeling or sensing every eye watching me at the front. That if I wasn't worshipping overtly, as I normally would do, then I'd be rumbled. People would know just how rubbish I was and I couldn't have that. So I, I knew I was consciously putting on an act to show that I was OK. And we may publicly perform because of a perceived or even a real sense of, of pressure of expectation. But the problem is when we do that, this pretense can help create that false expectation of what we should be like when we worship together. It's self-defeating in that way. We are driven by a fear of what if I'm found out? Well, let me tell you something. You already have been. And here is particularly what I felt the Lord highlighting to me in these three in these verses. Three times it says the phrase, your father who sees what is done in secret. As many of you know, I do like a good movie, sometimes even a bad one. But hey, everyone's a critic. But I can also kind of geek out at times and be fascinated by those DVD extras behind the scenes. How things are done, the process, the personnel that come together to make the cinematic marvel you've just watched. And if you don't know what kind of um, behind the scenes goes on, just sit for the end of a movie. And it shows you how many people are involved in making something happen. And the list of names and really odd jobs like, I don't know, a dolly grip. But Jesus is addressing the whole area of image and reality. He's addressing what's going on behind the scenes, what's really going on, why give, why fast, why pray, what's lying behind those practices. And while I was preparing this sermon, I felt the Lord was drawing me back again and again to the same theme and highlighting one particular word to me. And that word was secret. Verse four, it's in twice, verse six and verse 18. It says, then your father who sees what is done in secret. It's a message that's already been underpinning much of the Sermon on the Mount. It's also what's been underpinning the message of the Old Testament prophets like Amos. God is ultimately interested 
in your secret life. And that's what I sense today, a word that I felt God wanted to share. Guard your secret life with God. It is the wellspring for your outer life. Now, this idea of a secret life can maybe have some negative connotations. It hints at what is done in secret being perhaps less good morally than what's portrayed externally. And sadly, that is something that we're familiar with, whether it's a politician or even a church leader. It's revealed they've been living a double life and it's really devastating and it's usually not in a good way. But that's not exactly what I think the Lord is getting at. Yes, he is addressing about hypocrisy, people's actions and words not not matching up. But I think he's addressing it in a more positive way going forward. I think we can all say that it's easy to slip into a going through the motions in our faith, fooling those around us that all is well and maybe even fooling ourselves. Abraham Lincoln once said, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. To which I would add, you definitely cannot fool God any of the time. God sees us exactly as we are. A scripture that maybe we're very familiar with, Psalm 139, part of which message is essentially God knows everything about you, always has, always will. You cannot hide from him or hide anything from him. Now, this can be really encouraging or it could be quite disturbing because God is like a mirror reflecting back to us what we are really like. And we may not like it. This is the thing about the secret life. It's the life where you are the you when no one else is looking. But your father sees who you are and what you do in secret. With God, it is total exposure. Every dark thought, hidden habit, private sin, every motivation and attitude is seen and examined and known. And perhaps that might make us feel uncomfortable, even to the point of wanting to avoid that secret place of interacting with God. Times when it's just you and God in the room. Times when we can't hide behind our acts of righteousness. Even our regular devotions, we can't try and hide behind them. A quick read of a Bible note, a quick pray and then get out of there before God actually says something to me. Awareness of that total exposure before God can be uncomfortable, painful even at times. But the amazing thing is this, whilst with the secret life with God, there is total exposure. There is also total acceptance. God knew exactly what he was getting when he called each of us out of darkness, out of darkness into his glorious light. He knew what he was getting. He was not and is not under any illusions about any one of us. So there's no point, absolutely no point in pretending. Because here is a truth, and it's a truth worthy of acceptance. God loves us exactly as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. This is the experience of the secret life of God. It's the it is only experienced in that secret place with God. In fact, it's the only place to interact with God in that way. Whether you're in a room by yourself on your own with just you and God or whether you're in a hall surrounded by a hundred others, it's just you and God in that secret place where you can be all who you are, where you are the you that when no one else is looking, where all is known and no pretense or play is needed. Totally known, totally accepted, totally loved. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That secret place with God. And what we see here in Jesus' caricatured critique of the hypocrites and the pagans is that our outward actions actually genuinely need to be a reflection of our inward reality. Our secret life with God must be in sync with our life lived with and amongst others. This is reality. This is integrity. I remember whenever I was um, younger, not long after (laughs) that incident in the classroom, I was at a summer holiday club and, uh, you know, I I love the Bible. I love Bible stories. I was really good at memory verses. I was really good at quizzes and I loved that. I even knew every single song that we sang, including all the actions. 
And I recall one time I came up to two leaders, one that was really well established and one that was new. And the established one said, hey, this is this is Philip, because you know, that's what I was called then. And, and she said, oh, he's a Christian and, you know, his Bible knowledge is great and everything. And I know she was trying to encourage me, but I kind of something even then I knew something didn't add up. Because although I knew all this stuff and I would use Bible notes, I knew I didn't have a real relationship with Jesus. And at some point, maybe not, not long after that, I did come into a real relationship with Jesus. But at that time, at that moment, the image and the reality were just out of sync. And what I love about this is that Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 1 especially, he says, Be careful. Because I think Jesus knows that we can so easily get out of sync with our secret life with God and how we live externally. He says, be careful. But we need to aim, work at and commit to the fact that what we do in front of others is a true reflection of our heart and reality in relationship with Father God. But note this, the secret life with God does not mean a private faith. We are still called to be salt and light to those around us. But the only way we can do that is by attending to our secret life with God. Our secret life with God is the wellspring of our outward life with others. And we see this in the life of Jesus. How often in the Gospels do we read that Jesus often withdrew by himself to pray? This is Jesus attending to his secret life with his father. We see it explicitly in the event of Jesus coming down from the mount after the transfiguration. And their disciples who had been there um, at the foot of the mountain, they found it difficult. They couldn't release a boy who was plagued by an evil spirit. And Jesus does release this boy. And later they ask him why they couldn't. And Jesus answers, this sword can only be dealt with by prayer and fasting. Now, that's not in a methodical way or a magical way, but in the fact that it's in the regular, often the real secret life with God. That is where the power of God and the ability to live the Father's way comes from. A bit of a disclosure. My heart is to attend to my secret life with God in that similar Jesus way, devoting times and investing myself and in discovering more of him in his word and engaging with God through his spirit and prayer. And do I always achieve this? The answer is no. And that's the reality and that's the honesty with which I hope that we can live with. It's my heart, but sometimes I don't do it. And I'm so aware of those times that I don't guard and attend to my secret life with God. That I'm not as spiritually sharp or attuned as I could be. That I end up running on my own resources and ultimately end up running on fumes. That I forget that my security is solely to be found in my relationship with Father God. And I realise that I end up sometimes acting out and going through motions whenever I need God's spirit to be my fuel. But I know that the secret place with God is the source of strength and identity that I need. And I believe we all need to be the people God wants us to be, to live the lives he wants us to live. So in order to love others, first be with the one who first loved you. If you want to forgive others, First, spend time with the one who forgave you first, and then you can forgive. If you want to give to others, first be with the one who has given everything to you out of their own heart. You want to be more patient, kind, humble, hopeful, persevering. First of all, often be with the one who is the originator of all these. We need to invest prioritize, attend to and guard our secret life with God. Because without our often secret life with God, it can be a performance, self fueled not real and certainly not enough. And one service or one connect group a week, it's not enough. It's like one meal a week or, or as I've been um, training recently, one training session a week is not enough to be fit. It's our role to invest. It's our responsibility. It's our relationship with Jesus. It's our personal secret life with God that we need to attend to. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Guard and attend to your secret life with Father God. 
It is the wellspring for your outer life in living with others and in the way he wants you to.
Thank you so much for joining us for our service this morning. We hope you've enjoyed it and look forward to seeing you in person again soon. And if you're new and have been watching online but haven't yet come in person, then please do get in touch with us to let you know, let us know you're listening. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to close in prayer. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.